ADHD Rewired, episode 446. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host, and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is a more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection, and you are not alone. Go to ADHDRewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free and secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter. You can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups. Learn all about our award-winning coaching and accountability groups. You can co-work with us in our adult study hall virtual membership community. You can do all of these things by going to our website at ADHDRewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. We are here today for our live monthly Q&A. We are recording this on August 9th, 2022. We have our wonderful panelists, co-hosts, hosts of other podcasts and, and ADHD Rewired coaches. So let's introduce all of our friends here. So we got Will Curb, the host of Hacking Your ADHD. I almost missed that because I got distracted reading the question. So that feels on brand. On brand. And I love the blue hair with the matching blue shirt. Looking good. As long as I don't have a blue screen, I'm set. <laughs> now I'd like to see what that would look like. And we have MJ, who is the host of ADHD Diversified and ADHD Rewired Coaching's Chief Admin Peer Mentor. MJ, how's it going? It goes, it goes. How's everybody doing? We're doing well. And to your right, at least on my screen, is Coach Kristen Martz. How you doing, Kristen? Good afternoon from my neck of the woods. Down in I'm doing Arkansas. Great. Arkansas. Arkansas. Yeah. All right. And <laughs> we got Mr. Brendan at Mahan, the host of ADHD Essentials. Yeah, yeah. Thing, things go. The podcast has not been posted in a little while, but I'm getting back on the horse this week, so... Well, it sounds like I think your priorities have been where they've needed to be. And by the way, congratulations. I uh, saw that you just celebrated a big anniversary. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Our marriage is old enough to vote now. So Mazel tov. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and we have Lisa Cisla, my executive assistant and community manager. Hello, Lisa. Hi, everyone. And we had Kat Hoyer. And I'm not sure where she <laughs> just went. <laughs> so we're, uh, we'll be... Saying hello to her, I'm sure, again, if we watch for her in the panelists or in the uh, participant list, because I'm sure she will be right back. Okay, Sharon, you are our first uh, question. So what is your question? Uh, my question is, how do I help my spouse learn about ADHD? He's skeptical of the existence of the condition. Um, he's sort of semi-supportive, but not wholly supportive. It's like dragging a cow through mud. Mm. So first of all, that's that's hard. I think there's there that feeling of having to like explain and provide all of this support, like supportive evidence, to convince someone who is close to you. Yeah, that's a frustrating feeling. So I, I just want to acknowledge that first. The, the other the other thing I'll mention is that it's a recent diagnosis for me. Okay. So I'm just learning about it myself. Mm. So trying to explain it to somebody else when I'm still learning about it has been really difficult. And he's somebody who is evidence-based, which mm -hmm. is not something I'm really good at. Okay. Um, what have you tried so far in, uh, in these discussions? Uh, well, I've tried having him listen to some podcasts with me. I've tried to explain to him, you know, as things come up, sort of where I'm at and what I'm working on. I'm in the current coaching sessions. So he sees me at it every morning and night. And his idea is that it'll be once the coaching session is over, I'll be fixed. Oh, you can, um, if, he, if you, he wants to talk to me, I can let, I can straighten him out on that. Cause <laughs> yeah, that's, that's one of our guarantees that after our 10 weeks of coaching, you'll still have ADHD. I know, I know. And I think he wants me to get on to other things that, you know, I think part of it is he's feeling a bit excluded by it because I'm spending a lot of mm. time trying to get organized and try and get a handle on my life and what's, well, what's left of my life. And, um, Sharon, yeah. have you asked him about that? 
About what? If Which he, part? If he's feeling excluded. I haven't actually asked him that. That might be a worthwhile conversation. Yeah. All right, Will, what do, what's your thoughts on this? So most of the reason that people don't have a good view of ADHD is pop culture things because that's where we learn about it. And we're like, that's not a thing then because that's kind of how pop culture presents it. However, pop culture presents everything wrong. So if you can kind of use that as a uh, segue of like, there's something your husband knows a lot about that he sees in pop culture and goes, that's really dumb that they present it that way. And kind of being like, yeah, and that's also how they present ADHD is just... Mm -hmm wrong ideas and, you know, generalizations that don't really make sense. So um, if you find something that he's an oh, expert yeah. in and, and can be like, hey, look, this kind of works the same way. Um, and then there's also kind of this idea of motivational interviewing where <laughs> you kind of like not try to say like lead someone to yeah. the answers, but it's it's a little less leading and more like letting them come up with the the answers themselves. But, you know, I use it with my kids a lot, but it's also how I write my scripts is like how people come to the conclusions that will help them. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying hard to stay away from psychoanalyzing them. <laughs> <laughs> so the best thing I ever did for my marriage, and it's been going for 18 years, so yay, is not something I did. It's something my wife did, actually. We went to a training on ADHD with this guy, David Nowell, who was phenomenal. who's the first guest on my podcast. And it was just an overview of ADHD. It was just like, this is what ADHD is. It went kind of deep because there were clinicians in the in the building. There were teachers in the building. My wife, I think, was the only non-professional like professional who worked in the field of ADHD that was there. But she's a scientist, so she followed along with all of it. And I know that her view of me changed after that because it was like, this is what's weird about ADHD. This is why people with ADHD do the stuff they do, right? This is the stuff that doesn't make sense. It does make sense if you have ADHD and this mm -hmm. is why. And so when we were done, she had this different frame on who I was and why I made the decisions I made and why I took the actions I took and didn't take the actions I didn't take. And that was really powerful, right? Enough so that like she checks me every now and then in almost like a coach would, right? Well, she'll say like, well, we know that this always happens for you. So what if you do this instead? Or what would you say to one of your clients if you were struggling, if they were struggling right now and those kinds of things. And it's really helped our relationship. So I would do something like that. Okay. And, and it, it doesn't have to be like a seminar. It can be finding a coach that you're comfortable working with who can do that kind of a thing. And just, I do that. I walk people through ADHD and teach them what it is. But something along those lines is probably a good decision because hopefully it gets him on board. Can I ask a question about that? Yeah. yeah. So coaching could be for like the two of us versus yeah. just me or it could be just for him or. Yeah. You also might want to consider couples counseling, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, because this is around acceptance, right? Right. And part of what we, what we, I think we all want from our, our close relationships is to be seen. And I think yeah. that if he's skeptical I think it might require him asking, can he take sort of a leap of faith at this moment, right? Yeah. And take the assumption that everything that you are sharing and are trying to explain to him, can he try to take it at face value without the preconceived ideas that he has? You said he's very evidence-based. Russell Barkley has a ton mm -hmm. of lectures online that are completely free. So if he wants like the fire hose of science-based information, that's a great place to, to go. Uh -huh. If you'd be better with more bite-sized digestible stuff, you know, maybe consider things like how to ADHD or, uh, you know, Will's podcast is shorter than, than this one is. I think just hearing other people's stories can also be really helpful because there really okay. is no disorder in all of mental health that has more research and evidence-based for it than ADHD does. Right. Okay. That's great. Thank you so much. That's All very right. Helpful. All right. Good luck. Let us know. Thanks. All right. Let's uh, go on to our next question. Kat, welcome back. Thank you. I was, uh, yeah. Apologize. Everything okay? It is. It's just, you know, me and computer issues. Ah. I'm just so electric that it makes my computer not work well sometimes. Well spun. All right. We got Laura here. Laura, what? is your question. So I had, I think, one question that follows another, basically. Start with one, because we all have working memory issues. Exactly. So in the scenario um, that you come from a background where 
the concept of mental illness or ADHD or disorders or whatnot is not necessarily, um, I don't want to say like accepted, but it's almost like, and I don't want to say it's not believed, but it's almost like, well, my favorite quote is like, everybody's a little bit ADD and I kind of roll my eyes every time people say that. Mm -hmm. So how do you explain guardrails or things that may help for, particularly for my child with this condition, right? And say, hey, I would like for you guys to, if you're going to take care of her, don't load her up on sugar and hey, she may need transition periods and things like this for validation and then also to help them. Cause I, I tell people like, honestly, if I'm giving you this garbage for my child is so that you don't go bananas because she can be a lot. But at the same time, there's always that pushback because it's not as well received or, you know, accepted. Hopefully that makes sense. Absolutely. You know, so obviously we know here, not all disabilities are visible. And so mm-hmm. when we're dealing with invisible disabilities, you know, for some people, depending on sort of culture and how they were raised and the messages they got around things like mental illness, invisible disabilities, neurodivergence, you know, it can be a challenge. But I also think this sometimes could be a, a time where sometimes we need to actually establish boundaries because yeah. we can offer and we can ask them to, to accept and learn and take the information we're trying to share. But if mm-hmm. if you're getting that vibe that they're just like, oh, you know, they this kid just needs better discipline. I'll, I'll, I'll handle it. Right. And we get, we get that feeling where they clearly don't get it. Right. Mm -hmm. Then it's, you know, then you're having harder conversations with those people about, you know, the boundaries. And I said, when you say these kinds of things, it feels both dismissive and it is harmful to my child. Correct. All right. Mm -hmm. Brendan. Uh, I like metaphors as (laughs) you probably know. Mm -hmm. And the metaphor that I use most often for ADHD is asthma. And it's useful because they're both point of performance disorders. And I have both of them, so I can speak to both of them. The whole notion that everyone has ADHD, you could also say that everyone has asthma because if people go into smoky rooms, they're going to have trouble breathing. And if they run around a lot, they're going to have trouble breathing. So clearly everyone has asthma. That's insane, right? Like that sounds on its face ridiculous. But the same kind of logic is being used for ADHD. Mm -hmm. So... That's kind of my go-to metaphor, right? Is it's true that everyone has trouble breathing, but if Eric goes into a smoky building and I go into the same smoky building, I am going to struggle more because I have asthma. I could die potentially. I also have asthma, so we're both in trouble. All right, so so if Will went into a smoky <laughs> building and I went into a smoky <laughs> building, um, I'm gonna it's gonna hit me harder, right? Like that's just the nature of things. And since I know Eric has asthma too, it's going to hit Eric worse because he's like a foot taller than me. So the air will be a little better down where I am. Um, But, but it's important to recognize the nature of ADHD as a point of performance disorder. And that's what makes it seem like, well, doesn't everyone kind of have ADHD? No, everyone forgets sometimes and everyone loses track of the time sometimes. But for people with ADHD, it's all the time in the same way that everyone gets sad, but not everyone has depression. That might be less useful though, because if people, if the culture is like mental health, pshaw, that's not a thing, then talking about depression may or may not be useful. Sometimes mm-hmm. folks are more willing to accept depression than they are ADHD, so it might be helpful. But I, I like to try to wiggle in with a metaphor and see if that can get me some space. And and like what Eric said, boundaries are, are important, but also recognizing when we're talking about family, it's that can be a hard thing to set, right? Like, am I going to set a boundary and then never have childcare because I can never send my kid to my in-laws or my parents? And as a result, I'm overwhelmed and shutting down and life is actually more difficult because of that. I don't know. And, and I do want to say sometimes that is worth it. Know the cost. Sure. You know, I'm not, I wouldn't argue with that. I just, it's just a, you got to think about Absolutely. it. That's all. And I just want to uh, um, expand a little bit on what Brennan was saying about point of performance disorder, just in case uh, people aren't familiar with that, that terminology. Basically ADHD is not a, it's not a skill um, or knowledge deficit. It's the, the hard part is once we know what to do, this is where it can actually be frustrating because we're not doing it. That's ADHD. We're not doing the things that we know to do. So it's not about, Oh, you know better. Well, of course we know better. That's why it's called, it's ADHD, right? It, it's difficult to do, to execute the things, to carry out our intentions. That's what makes it so frustrating. And I always tell people, as frustrating as it is to those around us who don't understand why we're not doing the things we said we were, we were going to do, I promise you it's even more frustrating to us as people with ADHD. Mm-hmm. Kristen? 
I wanted to share that my oldest child, she's 30, she has severe autism and severe communication, uh, pretty much communicatively it has mutism in that sense. And when she was little, that was much harder for people to understand and see. And, and they were thinking, oh, well, she just, she'll start talking or you got to discipline her better. Things, things I'm imagining you're hearing some of with the ADHD. And we weren't sure if she had autism yet. It wasn't fully diagnosed and started going to a support group. And the woman who actually lives down the street from me nowadays, I had a child who was four years older, I think, than my Kylie. He didn't talk also. She was in graphic design and she created little kind of business sides cards because she got tired of trying to explain what it means. Back then, you know, Kylie's 30. Back then, it wasn't well understood. And there was so much more to autism like we know about nowadays. And ADHD, in my experience, is becoming that too. There's so much more about it rather than hearing the, oh, everyone has a little ADHD. So I found that a neat, wonderful tool. And he smiled a lot. So she had fun with what she wrote on the card. And it was something about why Miles smiles, something like that. And it highlighted the things about him particularly to help someone else in the community learn more about what autism actually is and what it means to her child. I don't know. Maybe that's an idea for you and your family or someone out there. And that can be really helpful in spreading the awareness and educating people because I think that's what it boils down to is the education is it has a lot of gaps right now and maybe that might be something that's helpful for you. Thanks Kristen. MJ? So coming from a culture and a background that and I'm grossly overgeneralizing here a culture and environment that has routinely dismissed ADHD and routinely dismissed any mental health existence ever and that's just been my experience Sometimes I find that I just can't talk about my ADHD in terms of saying that it's ADHD. Sometimes what has been helpful is saying like, this is how I experience this, or this is what's challenging for me and sort of leaving the ADHD part out. It just really depends on who I'm talking to. And another thing that helps with talking about those particular challenges, or if there's a need for an accommodation, especially when I see some of my friends with who I, I would suspect to be neurodiverse kids, because they just remind me a lot of me, is um, this is what has helped me to be most successful with this. Would you be open to trying that with my child? Because I kind of advocate for a couple of nieces and nephews who are they're adults now, but when they were having a hard time and it, and you know, the parents or the aunts and uncles were like, well, no, they're just being difficult. They're just being, they're not being nice. They're not following the rules. It's not that they're not following the rules. It's that they don't know how to ask for help. They don't know what they need. And if we don't know what they need as the adults in their lives, then yeah, that can make it hard to explain anything that's going on. It could be ADHD. It could be any other mental health issue. So really asking, you know, would you be open to helping with this? Because this is what I have seen be most like help my kid be most successful or help my kid calm down or get this done. And it, yes, it might take a little bit longer, but would you be open to, to trying that if you are going to be caregiving for my child? If you need to leave the ADHD part out, just highlighting the stuff that works and asking if the people in your child's life is open to helping with the things that are helping them be successful. All right. Um, so Laura, I hope that was helpful for you. That was awesome, guys. Thank you so much for, for your input. Let's take a quick break. That's a good place to pause. So we will uh, be right back with more of your questions. So we will be right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from ARC. ARC is ADHD Rewired Coaching at coachingrewired.com. Time is running out for you to join us this fall. Have you had the intention of joining ADHD Rewired's coaching and accountability groups, but missed all of our past registration events? Do you want to learn how to better manage your time, take charge of your calendar, and invest in your personal growth? Are you ready to become the director of your life? Do you believe that you can live intentionally and wholeheartedly, but are feeling stuck and just aren't sure where to begin? 
then this is the coaching community you've been looking for. Our last scheduled registration event is tomorrow, Wednesday, September 14th at 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. That's coachingrewired.com to start your pre-registration process so you can join us for our next fall registration event this Wednesday, September 14th at 2 p.m. Central. Two of our sections are already filled. The other three are filling up with only a few spaces left in each. So check the website for the most up-to-date information. The other CRS. Can't remember shit? Community remembers shit. As Eric Tivers often says, it's important to recognize that a component of ADHD is that we have CRS. Can't remember shit. A CRS can't be relied on as an excuse for not getting things done, for forgetting things, or for being late. Rather, being aware of it can help guide us to making strategic choices to try to compensate for it. I've come to realize that one of the special things about being a part of the art community is that it is the community itself that is a key strategy to helping us remember shit. Not the shit like paying bills. Make sure that shit like that is in your to-do list and or calendar. Uh with notifications and alarms as needed. No, what I'm talking about is that participating in the community, from our A-team, to our art group section, to the ARC Alumni Mighty Network, and even further to the ASH membership community, helps to remind us of the collective knowledge, wisdom, insights, tools, and strategies for living with ADHD, to which we all contribute, but which, on an individual basis, we invariably forget. Why do we forget? because we have CRS. In addition, participating in the community helps to remind each of us of what is possible, of the things we said we wanted to do, of what we still want to work on, that we can learn to do hard things, that it's okay when we fail (laughs) and fail again, and that failure is a meaningless ephemeral concept when we get back up and keep moving forward, and that we are not alone. So it turns out that one of the most powerful tools for mitigating CRS is another CRS. Community remembers shit. On my own, there's a very good chance that no matter how much I've learned or how many notes I've taken, I will end up forgetting a lot of the important lessons that I'm learning, even the ones I managed to write down in my learning log sheets. And I'll probably forget to continue practicing some of the skills I've learned Oh, and I almost forgot. I'm sure I'll forget to go back and work on some of the worksheets from group that seemed helpful, but which I just wasn't able to spend much time on. Perhaps more importantly, on my own, there's a very good chance that I'll forget to keep trying, to keep moving forward, to keep experimenting, to ask for help, and that there are other people with ADHD who both understand and want to help me. (laughs) Who the fuck am I kidding? There's not just a very good chance of that happening. It's virtually guaranteed. Why would it not be a surprise for me to forget all that and more? Because, as Eric Tivers promised before I signed up, at the end of group, I will still have ADHD. And a component of that is CRS. Fortunately, I've also now got the other CRS. Community remembers shit. I don't know about you. Well, maybe I do. But my world's still flooded. That's why I'll be hitching a ride on the Ark. I hope to see you all aboard. We are getting closer and closer to the beginning of our 30th season of coaching and accountability groups. So don't wait. Go to coachingrewired.com to start your pre-registration process and to get invited to our last scheduled registration event on Wednesday, September 14th at 2 p.m. Central. Registration is by invitation only and we would love to have you join us on the ARC. Because here at ADHD Rewired, we believe in growth through community. What sets us apart is being able to grow alongside others who can show us compassion and who truly understand the difficulties we face. It's amazing how a community who truly understands our daily struggles can have a positive impact on our lives and our members prove that we can do hard things and we don't have to do them the hardest way possible and we don't have to do them alone. 
So if you're ready to invest in your personal growth, go to coachingrewired.com to add your name to our fall interest list to join us this fall of 2022. Or if you're listening to this in the future, check out coachingrewired.com for the most up-to-date information on our upcoming season of coaching groups. You can also check the section availability, our schedules, and everything else related to our groups. Come grow with us and join the ARC. That's coaching rewired.com. That's coaching rewired.com. And we are back. We have another question here from Shane. Shane, what is your question? So one of the biggest problems I have trying to help my friends and a couple of family members I know, they have a lot of similarities to me because obviously we pull around who we uh, who we are, but they don't have access to health care or medical support or therapy. Uh, one of my friends lives in the UK and it's a three year wait to get mm-hmm. seen by psychiatrists and, and get diagnosed. And until then, they can't really get therapy. Like I know all the different things about building a positive support structure for them because of all the stuff that I've had to put in my own life, but I don't know what to tell them when they're they're struggling so hard and don't have access to that stuff, how to put things in place and build that kind of environment around themselves when they just don't have access to it. Like, Do you all have any advice on that? Yeah, so I know that um, ADA, which is the um, adult uh, ADHD organization, um, they have uh, monthly support groups online, virtual support groups. Um, and I know that membership is really, really affordable. Don't quote me on this. I think it's five dollars a month. It's I know it's something that's you know pretty low cost. So that's something that that you may want to look at. Um, also, Chad, uh, children and adults with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Don't try to work out the acronym. It doesn't really work. It confuses me every time. Um, so they also have other uh, resources as well. Brendan, what what do you have? A, f- a few thoughts. Um, depending on the, what's going on, there's all kinds of resources on the internet, right? Like Jessica McCabe's How to ADHD. Mm-hmm. There's this podcast called ADHD Rewired and Hacking Your ADHD and ADHD Essentials and ADHD Diversified. There's a bunch of podcasts out there that also provide support for specifically ADHD, but also other mental health disorders. There's stuff out there for OCD and depression and anxiety in general. And so don't sleep on the free stuff is what I'm saying. Like there's a lot of stuff out there. You can get pretty far by educating yourself um, and by having your family get educated too. So they understand what's going on. You're not going to get all the way there, but you can get further than you are. And when it comes to clinicians and kind of especially coaches, ask if they have scholarships, like just ask, like, look, I don't have that much in terms of resources. Are there scholarships available? Can you point me towards stuff? That's another thing you can say is like, go to someone and say, can you point me towards, and then they can maybe point you, or maybe they say, you know what, by chance, I have a free hour next week because a client canceled. I can't make it a permanent thing, but I can talk to you for an hour next week. Cause that not a big deal. Like that might happen too. I know it happens cause I've done all of those things. So uh, that, those are my thoughts. And if anyone uh, here in the live Q&A has any other resources, uh, throw them in the chat and, uh, and we can also put those in the show notes. Uh, can I ask a real quick follow-up? And I'm sorry, it just kind of, is there any good things that they can do that can kind of help them manage their symptoms? Like exercise, I, I kind of get them to understand that and stuff like that even though, well, that's kind of a hard one with the executive dysfunction. But that's the kind of the problem I'm running into is their executive dysfunction just doesn't let them do things like getting them to understand the need to do it and then follow through when they just literally can't. That's a painful conversation to have. Y'all understand that. Yeah, y'all get it. I just, it's a struggle for a bunch of my friends. Yeah. So, you know, consider a reframe from can't to haven't figured out how to yet. Right. So it really encourages them that that experimentation and sort of this understanding that there's going to be a bunch of things that we're going to try that actually probably won't work. But let's keep trying because the more we try, the more we are going to find things that do work. And I think that one of the, the big things that trips people up is they have not broken down that first step enough. You know, if you've you listened to the podcast long enough, you've heard me say every week, you know, starting is the hardest part, right? Like, Breaking down that first step. So if, if it's say exercise, what's going to make exercising easier? Maybe it's, you know, maybe they need to go to bed in their workout clothes 
and put their gym shoes right next to their bed, right? Little things like that can make a really, really big difference. Sort of tapping into what, what they find fun. It's sort of trying to be mindful of maybe that, that tendency towards, well, if I'm going to do it, I got to go 150% on this thing. It's like, how about let's just go 10% better than last time, right? So little incremental changes and improvements are really where, where progress happens. Like, you know, we, I think for all of us here as, as panelists, as coaches, as podcasters, as entrepreneurs, it might from the outside look like we've made this massive, have taken these massive actions to do these things. What we've done is we've done a, a bunch of small things, right? And it just stacks up to look like we have our shit together, <laughs> right? But all of us here with ADHD, you know, yes, we have areas of our life where we are successful. And I promise you, everyone here, from myself to everyone on the other panelists, we all have areas of our life that are also kind of a shit show. And part of ADHD management is learning how to sort of accept that without beating ourselves up and, you know, having that self-compassion say, you know what, like, I'm struggling here and I'm going to keep trying and it's not going to happen overnight. Kat, you had a, a thought you wanted to share. Um, a couple of things. One is since these are friends of yours, external accountability is one of the biggest things that, you know, have helped all of us. And I would say working together on some things on the flip side, because these are friends of yours. One of the things that we talk about in the coaching and therapy world is that we have to make sure that we're not working harder than our clients or members. Mm. So they have to want it too. And that might be a question to ask is, you know, how much do they want it? And then once they can kind of realize whether it is something that they really want to take some action on, then, you know, they can start working on an action plan that external accountability is a uh, key in helping us move forward in a lot of those things. Thanks, Kat. Brendan, did you have anything addition? Add yeah, I just, there's a theme that keeps coming up in all these questions that I'm just going to call I just want to call attention to. Everything from Laura saying like, well, how do I talk to my family about their ADHD isn't real to how do we help folks who don't have the resources to access professional help and all that stuff and they're struggling? What do I do? What kind of, what do I say? And those sorts of things. The thing that I keep hearing that I keep wanting to say, but I haven't said yet is I, I have three basic assumptions that I beat them to death in the parent groups. I bring them up a lot with my one-on-one -on -one clients and they've helped me in the very challenging time that I'm going through. So I'm in the midst of one of my kids is struggling with sort of consequences of the COVID pandemic, not getting COVID, but the anxiety that's coming with it for a lot of kids. One of my kids is getting hit by that. But I had a day where we were banging head, heads hard and I was like, this is not the dad that I am. And this is not the dad that I want to be. And I'm doing this wrong. It's not on him. It's on me. That's what I teach in my parent groups. Stuff rolls downhill, right? So, and responsibility goes uphill. So it's my job to fix it. It's not his job. He's not fixing it. He's 13. And I sat down on, on the bed and I was like, what would I say to my parent groups? And I literally looked at the slide in my head and I was like, everyone is doing the best they can. Everyone has good intentions and everyone wants to do well and please the people around them. And my relationship with my kid changed from that day to now, even though things got harder. My perspective changed and that changed how I interacted with him and that it fixed the relationship stuff. It didn't fix the other stuff that was going on, but it fixed the relationship stuff because I established a relationship with my kid. And those three assumptions, everyone is doing the best they can. Everyone wants to do well and everyone wants to please the people around them and, and everyone has good intentions. Well, operating on those assumptions is going to make things easier. And it, it helps me sometimes because there's days that I'm like, why can't I do this? What's wrong with me? Why do I suck so much? And I'm like, oh, no, I'm doing the best that I can. And today my best is not where I want it to be, but that doesn't make it not my best for today. Right. So what can my best for today do, even though it's not what I want to do? Like, what, what can I pull off? What can I actually be successful for? The trick then is to find something that's small enough to be doable, but big enough to matter, right? And so I just, I encourage kind of everybody, reframe some of the stuff we've talked about, have those three assumptions in mind and see where it gets you. I feel that very strongly, uh, Brendan. Thanks for sharing that. All right. Um, do we have another question? Julie, how's it going? 
Uh, it's going pretty well. Um, so I'm recently diagnosed at 55. My daughter was diagnosed a few years ago, but it just didn't sink in that maybe I had it as well. But I am trying to study for a certification and it's a renewal of a certification, but um, I let it, of course, lapse for too long and I have to do the whole class over again. I have a really hard time retaining information that I study. I can study for a couple of hours one day and then the next day it's as if it never happened. So it's just Groundhog Day for me. So I just am looking for tips and tricks or techniques or tools on how to actually retain information so that I'm actually learning it. Um, it's all stuff that I know, but I just feel like I spend so much time re just reviewing stuff and I never actually get anywhere. Julie, I love this question because this is a topic I should really, uh, really like. After I learned that ADHD uh, and started taking uh, medication for it, I realized, oh, like I can actually learn and, and do well in school. I didn't have the strategies. I What I did have was um, determination. And determination can take you only so far, but it also like leaves you hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of studying. Um, so, you know, compared to neurotypical peers, things take us longer. So yes. through a lots of trial and error and kind of figuring out, oh, well, this and that isn't working, I started learning more about how, how learning works, right? There's a really good book that I would definitely recommend for anyone that's doing uh, any kind of higher education. Um, it's called Make It Stick. And it's, it's the science of learning. And so one of the keys they talk about is, I mean, this idea of, you know, these three hour plus study sessions, like that doesn't work. What might work is three hours broken up over 30 minute increments over the course of a couple of days, right? So we need that space repetition. And even things like, you know, studying, there's a difference between studying and reading. Often people think pe like reviewing notes, reading the textbook, the studying, that's not studying, that's reading, right? Studying is you have to, there has to be a gap in information. So you have to see part of a piece of information and you have to be able to fill it in on your own without right. seeing the options. That's studying. That's how your brain connects what it's trying to learn and reinforces what it knows and can then uh, sort out what it doesn't know. So you could then use this idea of spaced repetition and you know, flashcards can be a really powerful study tool because you know you look at one side of the flashcard, oh, you got the thing wrong. Now put it just two cards back. So you're gonna see it again in, in, in two cards. It comes back again, all right, you got it right. Now put it four cards back. Oh, four cards later, oh, you, you forgot what it was again. Put it up again, two cards, right? And then as you get it correct more often, you push it and you space it more and more uh, back. And so it's that, that idea of spaced repetition is one of the most helpful ways for, for learning, but then also trying to see things through multiple uh, uh, different modalities. So one of the things for me that I have discovered is I need to see things presented in multiple ways to really, really grasp certain concepts. So I can maybe mm -hmm. read uh, an article about something and I might sort of get the gist of it, but then I might do a, a, you know, some research or I'll find a video on a, the, the same topic, but presented in a different way. And then it really starts to click. And I think one of the, the best ways to know what we really know is to try to teach it to somebody else. Yes. Yeah. I'm always better if I can either visualize it in my mind or if I give like I'm terrible I can't retain statistics at all and memorization is almost impossible for me unless it's something that I can make an analogy for mm -hmm. that's like interesting to me in my mind and also teaching it to other people is and I'm you know I'm interested in in training people as a personal trainer for exercise so but like memorizing muscles or Unless I can see a picture of it and how the mechanically things work, spatial recognition or like mapping something out in my mind, like even the human body is really hard for me. I have to come up with, you know, tip like make a funny rhyme out yes. of it or something that's it, really inappropriate. It, that will help me remember it. Julia, that's, I was, I'm so glad that you said that because that's actually one of my favorite strategies is especially if you, if you just have to simply memorize like uh, uh, something, the more sort of like funny, inappropriate, our brain just latches on to that kind of stuff, right? So those are, those are also really, really uh, powerful ways to, to learn. 
Um, and yeah, and, and by the way, make sure you're getting a good night's sleep because it's, if you don't, it's kind of like putting all this information in the storage drawer, but your storage drawer has a big hole in it. So you're surprised every time you reopen that drawer and go, where did it all go? Yes, a- absolutely. I can, it wears me out to, to study. I mean, I realize how tired I get when I'm doing things that are, don't come naturally to me. And, um, I only have a limited amount of energy and it's always in the, in the morning. It's never at night after work or after a full day. So yeah, what, what sometimes looks good on paper for scheduling when, when we're going to do things does not work well in real life. Right. Cause it's, exactly. you know, we, we, have, we have our free time in the evening, but we're also tired in the evening. And so stuff that requires higher level of concentration, it's not going to happen. Mm-mm, absolutely not. Right. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's go to another question and then we're going to take a quick break. So I think we're going to take this moment to take a quick break. So we will be right back. If you are listening to this early enough on the day it came out, you can join me and the rest of the ADHD Rewired team for our monthly live Q&A. Go to ADHDrewired.com slash events to register to join us on Zoom. Every month, I am joined by my fellow podcasters on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network, including Brendan Mahan of ADHD Essentials, Will Curb of Hacking Your ADHD, MJ Siemens of ADHD Diversified, and I am also joined by ADHD Rewired coaches Kat Hoyer and Chris. Kristen Martz. Go to ADHDrewired.com slash events to get notified and register to join us on Zoom. Then find this podcast and all of our shows by going to ADHDrewired.com slash podcast network and keep tuning in every week because we might just be launching a new podcast or two very soon. Just putting that out there for a little accountability. Find out more about ADHD Rewired at ADHDrewired.com slash podcast and consider leaving a rating and review in your favorite podcast player if you enjoyed this podcast and find value in the show. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss our newest episode every week. That's ADHDrewired.com where you can find this podcast and all of our shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network and everything else we do here at ADHD Rewired. That's ADHDrewired.com. And thanks for listening. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from Adult Study Hall at adultstudyhall.com, the virtual co-working community built for adults with ADHD who just get it. From our weekly guided sessions, also known as ASH Plus, to our 24-7 drop-in room, this just might be the virtual co-working community you didn't even know you needed. It's only $19.99 a month, and it's free to try for the first week. This is the virtual co-working and body doubling community where people with ADHD are getting things done while also having some fun because we don't have to tackle any of our to-dos alone. Come join us. Try it risk-free for the first week and it's only $19.99 a month after that. Go to adultstudyhall.com. That's adultstudyhall.com. All right, let's let's come on back here. Deborah, what is your question? My question is, as a mother of a very recent college graduate who is brilliant but has ADHD that he does not treat himself for in any way and uh, refuses to, has somehow got through a very high-end college, he is very, very overwhelmed with the whole process of looking for a job. It's overwhelming and he will not accept any help. And I see him like a deer in the headlights and not knowing what to do first. I think there's overwhelming fear of the future, fear of failure, and it's paralyzing. And as a mother who has scaffolded him, older mother of just the one child, it's very hard to sit back and watch this and not do something. All right. So for issues sort of like this, we kind of have to play the long game, right? Because I would probably, I mean, I'm just making some assumptions here. He does want help. It just might not be from you. And that is not personal. That is developmental, right? So you said he's 22 years old? Yes. So developmentally, he's like 19, maybe. 
And so that, that individualization and trying to try to separate from, you know, family of origin is completely normal developmentally. Also, when our you know, parental figures are the ones that are kind of like, you need to do this, you need to do that. Unfortunately, sometimes our brain goes, oh yeah, because the oh yeah actually can become more stimulating to the brain than going, you're right, mom, mm-hmm. right? Of course. So I think that when, especially at the age that they're at right now, the more that you can instill in him that you believe that he's going to kind of figure it out. And even if he trips and falls, that you believe that he has the ability to learn from that, any of those mistakes and to get back up. I think that that becomes the most powerful way you can support him. And so by not saying, you have to take my help, saying, I'm here to help if you want, but I believe that you, you know, you're going to figure this out. And I believe that it, it might be a struggle, but I think you can do hard things, you know? So we're here for you if you need, but like, this is you now, right? And so sometimes by, by taking the approach that you're not going to like force the help, it sort of helps them feel that, oh, this actually is mine to own. Sort of organically, they may come to that point where like, oh, I actually do need help. Is, uh, is your son taking medication? No, he no. is not. Okay. And he refuses. Okay. Yeah, refuses all through most of college, a tiny bit of riddle in here and wow. there. Was this, but, was this a battle between you two? Um, uh, a struggle, okay. a struggle because he doesn't believe in it. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. And, it, you know, like you can imagine, I, I, you know, visually, I just feel like saying, just let me help you. Let me, let me. Yeah. But I know it doesn't help ultimately. And it doesn't give him the grit that he needs to ultimately succeed, but he can't wait to get out of the house. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. He knows what it's going to take to move out. And, you know, when, when our kids are kids, I do, don't think we should let our kids fail. Like, I think that it, like we should, we need to support them. We need to be their safety net, right? We need to like let them fall down, but we need to also offer that hand back up, right? Now that he's a young adult, sometimes I think as we are sort of growing into our own, we need to struggle a little bit to figure stuff out. If stuff's hard and we know we have a, a rescue sort of behind us, it is not going to enable us to maximize what executive function skills we do have, right? Because when we're motivated and motivation is either we really want something or we want to avoid pain. And wanting to avoid pain is actually the, the is our humans' strongest motivators is the avoidance of pain, right? Because you could be completely stuck on the couch, but if something's on fire, you're getting your ass off the couch as quickly as you possibly can, right? Because you don't want to burn. So if... They're like, all right, like you, you're on your own. Like you have, you need to get a job. You, you have this amount of time to, uh, that will support you. And then you're on your own. And once they start struggling, it becomes real. And when it becomes real, it can help with activation. You know, it's, it's sort of that time where he's got to fly. And sometimes we need to push the, the bird out of the, the nest. And sometimes that first coming out of the nest is not going to be pretty. But I think we can, if we can really transmit that belief that they're going to figure it out and you'll always be there for them. I think that it will get closer to that. One other point I wanted to uh, touch on, I think this is important for our our listeners who are parents, especially if we have teenagers, is when teens, this is what the research shows, when teens resist medication and parents are really pushing it on them, it significantly increases the likelihood that they will not go on it in their 20s when they need it. The inverse is true as well. When it is a collaborative decision or it's a discussion and you sort of allow them to, to not be on the medication if they don't want it, they are more likely to make the decision to go back on it themselves in their early adulthood. So that's, that's a tricky piece and that's, that's, that's nuanced, but I think it's really something important for us to, to know. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I just have, have one other question. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about giving him deadlines? Because we did impose a deadline saying after which time you have to get something. I don't care if it's, you know, bagging grocery, you must get something. Can I respond to that with a question? Of course. How do you feel about following through on consequences and what you said would be the consequence if you don't? Oh, well, I guess the question is what are the consequences right now? He has not asked us for money, so it's not like he's money dependent. And that's, well, I that's, don't know if that's, that's actually true. He's living under your roof. He's money dependent. Once we start paying, you know, charging him rent. Yep, absolutely charging rent. 
um, which is extremely reasonable. Does he have a car? He does. And there's car insurance, of course, that mm-hmm. right now we're paying for. That's another you one. Know, there are things. There are things. I've had to put him in my, uh, on my health insurance now that school, you know, he's out of uh, the school. Under and the and school. I would say that, like, you know, keep him under your coverage because that, that's just the nature of our, the system that we have here. But he needs to pay for it, right? So he actually does have expenses. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because part right now, it's kind of cozy for him. Oh, yeah. Right. As much as he hates it, you're right. It's easy. And it's tenable, even though he says it's untenable. Emotionally, mentally, yeah. it's not good for him. But financially, it's not, he, he's not hurting. Yeah. Just keep, keep telling him that you believe that he can do it. I just really try to do everything you can to instill that sense of confidence. Because I think what he is feeling is something that a lot of, of us feel in our early 20s. is We realize that we have no idea what the hell we're doing. Right, Kat? I just wanted to uh, let you know, Deborah, that I, as a career coach, the majority of my business was being hired by moms, helping their sons in their early 20s. And what I found in working with them was that a lot of what was happening for these young men was you mentioned fear of failure. I think you probably even mentioned fear of success. There's a lot of imposter syndrome that's happening for these guys at that point where they're like, they're dismissing all of the success that they've had to get to the point that they're at. So they're afraid to take those next steps. And they never articulated it that way. But what I noticed was when I would start working with them on asking them what their successes were and things like that, that was when they would start to kind of come alive and realize that, oh yeah, I guess I do. I I have done some things and I can do this on my own. I would agree that like an external person helping with that. And then I would highly encourage an invoice, itemized invoice of what you are paying. You know, even if it is something like, hey, we'll put this, we'll put this in the bank and give you half of it when you move out or some type of action plan that you work on together um, that feels like this is him being supported, but like, you know, a little bit of what we like to call compassionate ass kicking. Yeah. Yeah, compassion first, but it follows yeah. that by asking him. That's great. Thank you so much, Kat. That really is, uh, you know, I will also put out there, and I'm sure you've seen that, also heard this, Kat, from your clients, that um, the kids, they, they feel like they look at a job description and they feel like they have to know, they have to know all these things. Job descriptions are really tough. I put, you know, I'm an employer myself and have been doing human resources, putting out job ads. And it, he says, well, God, what if I can't do this? And I keep saying, it's entry level. You will be taught. You are not expected to walk in there, you know, feet on the ground running and make yourself that valuable. You know, you have to learn. But it's scary. Yeah. The expectations. What if I fail? What if I can't do it? What if I'm, a, a, as you said, imposter syndrome? Absolutely. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, and I think even like adding to that point of what if I fail, say that you will, but like, what if you don't get back up, right? It's okay if you fail. You, like, as soon as you've learned from that failure, it's no longer a failure. I think it's so important that we're communicating with our, our kids, with each other, with ourselves, that like failure is not terminal. It's just, you know, I think it's a Zig Ziglar quote. Failure is uh, an event, not a person. So like failure is, it's, it's been one of my most influential teachers, Right. If we can sort of let go of the shame of failure, it can be really powerful to sort of lean into that. Brendan, go ahead. Do you have a... Yeah, just one last thought on where to draw the line on helping. I like to think of it as helping someone start their orange. So go as far as you can go where then he has to take it over on his own. So, right. And that might mean like you help him get the resume together. You help him apply to the jobs, but you can't do the interview for him and you can't do the job for him, right? Like he might need that much support to get him going, right? He Because he, if he's frozen at, I don't know how to apply to a job or I don't know like how to find jobs to apply to or something like that, you've got to get him past that. And then once the interview happens, assuming he gets there, that runs itself. And when he gets the job, that runs itself. But right now he's stuck in this land where he has to be super proactive yeah. and he needs help with that. All right. Um Let's look to see. We had a couple of questions that were upvoted here. All right. Uh, So this person says, I have been treated for ADHD since I found out 20 years ago, 
but now NeuroHealth says I have no ADHD and I have 1000% Asperger's. I'm confused and uh, immobilized. Okay, so there's a lot of interesting parts to this question. One, Asperger's is no longer a diagnostic label, although I think it's still in the, the, um, the what is the I, ICD-10, um, the World Health Organization's manual, I think that might still be in there. It's definitely going to leave the lexicon soon enough because it was absolutely invented by Nazi scientists to yeah. distinguish the good autism people from the bad ones. Mm. So it's really rough. Mm. Yeah, I know that this is a really like interesting and strange and sad history there. So, you know, I think anyone... I don't care how good of a diagnostician they are. Any diagnostician that says a thousand percent anything doesn't understand the way statistics works. <laughs> and diagnosis is based on statistics because you're looking at what is the probability when this many criteria are met that this person has this particular condition or disorder, right? And so still the gold standard is, um, you know, checklist, diagnostic interviews. We're looking at sort of symptom checklists. You know, I used to do a lot of work with, with uh, individuals on the autism spectrum. And I had one client that, and I worked with a lot of uh, um, later in my, my sort of clinical career and more like sort of the higher end, less severe uh, autism. And one of the things that I was fascinated by was the one client who I thought had just pure autism without ADHD. And I almost like struggled because I did, it was so different because they used to say that ADHD and autism can't be diagnosed together. This was many, many years ago. And talk to anyone who has worked with people with autism, and they'll say like, that's absurd, right? So just statistically speaking, if you have an autism diagnosis, you probably also have ADHD. And you might want to look for a second opinion. Anyone want to add to that? So one of the things, one of the psychiatrists who was actually a psychiatrist for both my children at one point, and then later on at a completely different facility, um, he taught me, I, I kind of buy into this, um, but it, it also depends on, you know, looking at that person, that the ADHD piece can look symptomatic of what's going on in autism with an autism diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Did I speak that clearly enough for it to make sense? Repeat. I hope so. I think it's worth so, repeating. So in other words, because medications don't always work for ADHD for a person who might be on the spectrum or in any other kind of comorbidity could happen, that they could have the full clear diagnostic criteria uh, required to get an ADHD diagnosis However, these are behavioral, you know, ob observations, and they're also subject to the fact of my definition of very often could be somebody else, some other parents' different kind of definition of because you're collecting all this information to get these diagnoses um, as part of that diagnostic experience. So, though it looks like it, the medicine might not work and be one of the things that works for it. So he sees it more as a symptom of what's going on in the bigger diagnosis of the person. So that makes sense. And it all boils down to what are you treating? Are you treating the person or are you treating the diagnosis? Right. Who cares? Just get what you need. I know that diagnoses for me, it's about paying the bill. It is also about finding your group for supports leading you down, you know, better paths to interventions and strategies and treatments and tools. That all makes sense. However, there's so much overlap with those things. I just, I just caution people to not get too wrapped up in the diagnosis because then it becomes just a label and you, we are not labels. Yeah, you know, it's, it's diagnostic labels are a starting point, but like the, the degree of divergence, even just amongst ADHD, there are thousands of flavors of ADHD. And same thing is true for autism because they all can present, each symptom can present differently. And for some people, there might be a symptom or two or three that doesn't even show up. There might be some for some people that is like their most severe and for somebody else, like not even on the radar. So you really need to, to understand like that a diagnosis is a starting point, 
what we really need to look at is functional impairment. Like how is this affecting your work, your social relationships, your family relationships, your financial uh, health, your, your physical and mental health, like all of these kinds of things, your, your daily self-care, your social interactions, right? Those are the things that, that are targets for intervention and also find your community. All right. I know that we are uh, running out of time here. So um, we're going to bring this one to a close. Lots of really, really fantastic questions today. So thank you for uh, asking your questions and for being here. We do this every second Tuesday of the month, same time, same place. Mr. Curb of Hacking Your ADHD, would you please leave us with a moment of dad? Well, I did just get back from a big road trip with my family and I did have to check my tires on the way home because there was just so many forks in the road. Nice. <laughs> you know, Will, a, uh, <laughs> a, steak, a, a steak pun is a rare medium. Well done. Oh, man. <laughs> Forks of the road was so good. <laughs> That wasn't that wasn't bad, Eric. I'm just playing. That was awesome. That I love the so, I, the I, I can't take ownership of, of that. Um, it's an app called Dad Jokes. Okay, so Mom. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Uh, we will uh, hopefully catch all of you next month. We hope that this was helpful for for all of you. Thank you. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find timestamped summaries and additional resources for each episode. Apply to join our free and secret Facebook community. Learn more about our award-winning intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. Join the Adult Study Hall virtual co-working membership community. Find all the other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't hear anywhere else. And use the search tool to find episodes on specific topics. You can do all of this at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click on the Patreon button. If you are a regular listener, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to you, the listener, but it's not free to produce. Plus, patrons get cool perks like ad-free episodes and access to recordings of coaching calls and $25 a month patrons and join me once a month for a group coaching call. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see selective interviews and other videos I've made. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, family, your therapists, your coaches, doctors, siblings, parents. And if you, your coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at the website, ADHDrewired.com. If you are a member of Chad, Ada, or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this show and all the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. And if you really loved this particular episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I do count on you to help spread this message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other app that supports reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Here is my list of must-listen-to audiobooks updated July 2021. Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, attached by Amir Levin and Rachel Heller. Atomic Habits by James Clear. The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. 
The Coaching Habit by Michael Stainer. The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Rest by Alex Sujong Kim Pang. The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins. Make It Stick. The Science of Successful Learning by Peter Brown. The Productivity Project by Chris Bailey. Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions, Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. I always recommend to my coaches and admin that they read that book. The One Thing by Gary Keller, a required reading for all of our coaching group members. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Baden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. And if you're looking for something a little bit more magical, I have fallen in love with the Harry Potter series and the narrator, Jim Dale, is amazing. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus, all of her stuff is great starting with Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, and The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or leader, be sure to check out her book, Dare to Lead. Do you have something that you would like to share? Click on the podcast tab at ADHD Rewired. Click the button to be a guest at the top of the page and schedule a 15-minute interview. This is Eric Tippers, reminding you to keep learning, growing, and connecting. Self-care is not selfish. No matter what you get done or don't get done, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things and we don't need to do them in the hardest way possible. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.